Hey guys, we just finished dealing with different units of concentration and now we're going to put those units of concentration to work. And we're going to do that by taking a look at colligative properties. And colligative properties are, by definition, properties that depend upon sure I write this correctly, um, properties that depend upon the number of particles in the solution. They're not dependent upon the identity of those particles, they're simply dependent upon how many particles are in solution, and the more particles in solution, the greater this colligative property effect has. So, we have like four major colligative properties that we're going to just deal with and, and this certainly goes along with the solutions chapter because we don't find these when we have just a pure substance. So the first one that I want to talk to you about is vapor pressure lowering. And we've already talked about vapor pressure. We dealt with vapor pressure in that last chapter. And so we know that if, if we were to have a beaker of water and we close that beaker up so that it's got a lid on it, that at some point the water is going to start evaporating. And so we'll get gas particles up here. And then eventually we'll reach an equilibrium where we'll also have some of those gas particles condensing back into the liquid form. And therefore there is this vapor pressure that develops. Well, it turns out that when you take a beaker of water and you dissolve some salt in it or any kind of a solute, it doesn't matter what that solute is, um, for this particular case we'll just call this salt water. So we've got salt dissolved and again we put a lid on it. What we find is that yes, the water starts to evaporate and an equilibrium is established again, but in that equilibrium the vapor pressure in that solution is lower. And so there's some sort of interplay here that is causing the solute to actually prevent that solvent from evaporating as much. And there's a lot of actual theories as to what is causing that, you know, is the solute blocking the solvent from actually escaping and, and they don't think that that is actually the case. Certainly there could be some interactions um, of attractions that are, are taking place there. Um, but what we are most concerned with is how might we compute, if we know what the vapor pressure is at a given temperature, how could we compute what the vapor pressure would be of the solution? And we have something known as Raoult's Law, which allows us to actually do that calculation. And for that calculation, that calculation is if you want to find the vapor pressure of a solution, it's equal to, now here we use one of our concentration units, the mole fraction. We use the mole fraction of the solvent and you multiply it by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Now in this case the vapor pressure of the pure solvent would be the vapor pressure of water. But one thing that we need to take into account, I'm going to bring up this idea, is you must, raise that up a little bit for you, uh, must take into account something called I, which we're going to see again when we deal with boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. But essentially what I is referring to, that's the number of particles that a compound breaks into. And so before we kind of continue on with, with vapor pressure, we have to understand this idea. So if we have something like sodium chloride, which is composed of the positive sodium ion and the negative chloride ion, I is equal to two because there are two ions. If it's magnesium fluoride, um, I is equal to three because it breaks up into one magnesium but two fluorine. If you're talking about sugars, 
C12, H22, O11, that's molecular. And so that doesn't dissociate when it dissolves into water. So for something like sugar or any molecular compound, I will be equal to 1. So that's what I mean when we have to take into account I. So I just want to give you an example for how this might play into um, what we're doing if we're calculating it. So if, for example, I have one mole of sodium chloride and it is dissolved in five moles of water, and at the temperature that I am at, I know that the vapor pressure of the water is equal to 27 millimeters of mercury. And of course, that is dependent upon temperature. We would have to look up the difference. So if we were going to compute the vapor pressure of the solution, and again, I'm just kind of writing that back out again, that's equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the solvent. We know the vapor pressure of the solvent because that is going to be the 27 millimeters of mercury. Oh, it just kind of had to catch up there for a second. So that's the vapor pressure of the solvent. The mole fraction of the solvent here is going to be, because it's the solvent, so the solvent's going to go on top, that's going to be the 5 moles of water. But now when we look at the total moles, the total moles are going to be a result of the 5 moles of water, but also the fact that we have 1 mole of sodium chloride. Well, when sodium chloride dissolves, the fact that we have to take into account I, it's actually dissolving into two ions. It's dissolving into a mole of sodium ions and a mole of chloride ions. And so that's what I mean by taking into account I. I is 2, so we've got actually two moles of ions. So when we go back and look at the total moles, the total moles is going to be the 5 moles of water plus the 2 moles of ions when we compute that. And so as a result, it's going to be 5 sevenths times the 27 millimeters of mercury. And that will now be the vapor pressure of the solution. And as you can see, 5 sevenths of 27 millimeters of mercury is certainly going to be less than 27 millimeters of mercury because the vapor pressure is lower. Now, that's going to kind of lead us in to another one of our colligative properties. And that is boiling point elevation. All right, to understand boiling point elevation, we have to go back to what we talked about in the last chapter, remembering that if something is going to boil, we have these little microscopic bubbles, just kind of reminding you we just did this. And so we've got air pressure pushing down on, on the water, if this is water. And in, remember that in order for something to boil, the vapor pressure of that water, that the, the vapor pressure it's inside those little bubbles, has to become equal to air pressure. So here's the thing. When you have pure water, and let's say it's taking place at one atmosphere, it's going to boil. You know, that's the normal boiling temperature. At one atmosphere, we know that the vapor pressure of water will become one atmosphere at 100 degrees Celsius. Well, it, it turns out that if you have salt water or sugar water or, oh, see, there goes my battery, um, or any kind of, of solute dissolved in the water, actually, we don't need a lid on that for it to boil. That would be kind of dangerous. Um, so if we have salt water, turns out that it boils at higher than. 100 degrees Celsius. Well, I want you to think about why that is. If the vapor pressure of the water has to become equal to air pressure, but as a result of the solute being dissolved in that water, 
the vapor pressure has been dropped. So it basically means that it makes it harder for it to become equal to the air pressure. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you must heat it to a higher temperature to get the vapor pressure to become high enough to become equal to air pressure. And so the boiling point, therefore, gets elevated and goes up. So that's the basic premise behind that. It really, boiling, as we mentioned before, is all about vapor pressure. And if we lower the vapor pressure as a result of a solute being dissolved, then we essentially are raising the boiling temperature. All right, so computing that, if we want to compute the boiling change in the boi boiling point, we have an equation. Delta T sub B is equal to K sub B times M times I. And what delta T sub B is referring to is this is the change in the boiling temperature. This is not the boiling point. This is the change in the boiling point. K sub B is the constant. This is the boiling point elevation constant. And for water, it's 0.52 degrees Celsius per molal. That's specific to water. This M is not referring to mass. I can't show the italicis here. Um, but this is referring to molality, moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. And I, once again, is the number of particles that a particular compound will break into. So if you want to compute and you know the molality, the concentration of something, you can actually go ahead and calculate the delta T sub B. That is not the boiling temperature, though. So if you compute the delta T sub B, for example, to be equal to 1.17 degrees Celsius, that certainly wouldn't make sense as a boiling temperature. So if we're talking about a water solution, we now need to add that to the 100 degrees Celsius to find the new boiling temperature, which in this case would be 101.17 degrees Celsius. And so we have to consider the fact of what that actually means. Um, another thing, then, that is also important, which is the third one and is very much related, is the freezing point depression. And it turns out that if there is a solute in the solution, it's harder to freeze the solution. It's harder for those molecules to organize themselves in this very nice neat pattern because essentially there are solute particles in the way. So there, look, there goes my battery again. Um, so we're going to wrap this up really quickly. Um, so in other words, we have to get it colder for it to organize itself properly. If you notice, it's virtually the same exact formula except you replace the B's with F. So it's delta T sub F, which is the change in the freezing temperature. K sub F, which is the freezing point depression constant. It is a different constant. It's 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal for water. Again, we have the molality and I, the number of particles that it will break into. So this is actually one that we're going to be doing a lab on, and we will talk about that lab in class, but we are going to um, investigate freezing point depression in the lab. So we're going to finish up this video right now, but we have one other colligative property that we will be talking about, and we will talk about that one in class, and that is osmotic pressure. So we'll leave you in suspense until we chat about it in class.